Now on to the good stuff. I'm going to introduce you to our guest tonight. Robert Simonson writes about cocktails, spirits, bars, and bartenders for the New York Times. He is author of A Proper Drink, The Old Fashioned, Three Ingredient Cocktails, and The Martini Cocktail. His writings have appear appeared in Food and Wine, GQ, Lucky Peach, Whiskey Advocate, and Vibe and Punch, where he was contributing editor. Thad Volger tonight will be... Vogler will be uh, in conversation with Robert. He is the owner of no True Nomond and the James Beard award-winning bar Agricole in San Francisco. For nearly two decades, he worked to design, open and manage the bars at more than 20 top Bay Area venues. In 2011, Vogler was named Forbes Mag one of Forbes Magazine's most interesting people. Oh, that's quite a distinction. Oh, wow. a, glo a global authority on craft spirits. He is consulted regularly by national and global press, including the New York Times, Der Spiegel, the Washington Post, Sunset, and other fine publications. So without further ado, Robert and Thad will chat away, hopefully make some cocktails, and please submit your questions, and we'll make sure to get to as many as we can. Welcome. Thank you. I am going to take over and intro. Um, first of all, thanks to Bookhampton and RJ Julia, the flagship and the Westland shop. I haven't been to the RJ Julia's, but uh, have been to Bookhampton. Robert and I did an event there a few years ago, which was pretty amazing. We walked out into uh, the twilight and walked along the water and there's an amazing group of people. All were interesting. Like we talked about a Fitzgerald novel that was based near there and just the kind of uh kind of yeah. people i had always imagined i would spend all my time with um but sadly it's about one night every 10 years that's like that truly but um i met robert first in person at uh cafe trieste which yes. is uh, a literary cafe in san francisco it's one of the few places in san francisco that has that kind of new york cultural capital um Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, rest in peace, died quite recently. It was the sort of the beatnik cafe and there are still <laughs> some beatniks around. Um, but yeah, then they still actually do poetry readings and all. And um, I was excited to talk to Robert. He was researching the book, uh, A Proper Drink. And we got to sit down and talk for, you know, like an hour. And again, this was one of those moments where I got to be in conversation with someone literate and charming and I'd always hoped my life would be uh, populated by that kind of, that kind of person. So it's a nice moment for me, uh, which I sort of wasted trying to explain to Robert why American whiskey's lame um, <laughs> and things like that. Um, and uh, I wondered if we'd really really connected. Uh, he came to the bar later on, made him some drinks, and anyway, we've been friends since. And the book. Uh, all of his books are good. Robert does bartenders um, a real service in his kind of um, research and, uh, you know, canonization stuff. I mean, bartenders are lazy. Uh, we like to tell apocryphal stories and, and not really be accountable. So to have someone who has real chops, both writing and uh, journalistic, kind of get this stuff down is a real resource mm -hmm. um, in particular. And, and then and Robert will talk more about it, but that's tequila is a, is a relatively modern addition to the, to the, the drinks canon. And, and this is a real service for people in my community, this book. Um, also, I, you know, I've never been as interested in recipe as I have been in what goes in the recipe, um, which makes for a kind of nice synergy between me and Robert. I, I, I source spirits. Um, Robert's going to start making a drink. Um, yeah. Which, one of your uh, drinks. One of mine, it, it, his choice, um, the single village fix. Um, this is a good example of kind of what interests me. This was a while ago before Mezcal, as Robert writes generously in the book, was being included in, in many drinks and, and just was loving uh, the spirit, loving Mezcal, uh, loving, loving. Uh, single origin mezcals and and um, trying to figure out how to uh, to get get it in a drink. Um, a fix is a really simple three ingredient drink that's off that's sweetened historically with um, you know in the 19th century you see recipes with pineapple, 
uh, syrup, um, yep. not or or others. Um, and a friend of mine was making a really beautiful organic pineapple syrup, and they call the heart of the agave the piña. Uh, though, as Robert says, it's not a relative of the pineapple; it's a relative of the asparagus. But there's a nice, simple relationship between the uh, the pineapple and the the sort of um, piña flavors uh, of of the mezcal and some fresh lime and Bob's your uncle. So he's yeah. making that. Maybe he should mute to protect us from his thunderous shaking. <laughs> if, he, if he does shake, yeah. Well, uh, I ju- we I go. just learned his his middle name is Odin. So beware when Odin shakes. Um, so yeah, for me this is a literary friendship, and for Robert I think it's a drinks based friendship. But either way, I'm always delighted to uh, to every time I get to talk to him, uh, as should you be. So my plan today is to hammer. Robert with questions. Um, I have 25. It seems unlikely we'll get through. Um, But like I say, I'm such a big fan of Robert as a writer. um, And that's what interests me most about him. Cheers. Cheers. It's just right. Um, You know, there's the idea of of using an expensive ingredient in in a recipe, which I'm a fan of. We'll talk more about it. Robert is not. But uh, sort of having a having a writer like Robert do a recipe book to me is kind of like putting a twenty five year old Scotch in a, in a Rob Roy. It's just a it's a great luxury uh, to have the prose that surrounds these recipes and introduce them be so elegant and um, so he's such a beautiful writer. Um, the book that really blew my mind most of all that I had touched on was uh, a proper drink, and that's like the, the of human bondage of, of my community. It spans generations and um, he manages to talk about death and life and everything uh, that's beautiful about the human experience in his really elegant history of my industry, which I still don't know why he wrote, but I <laughs> love it. It's a great book. Every, everyone in my community loves it. Um, but with no further ado, as they say, I'm gonna start to uh, batter uh, Robert mm-hmm. Odin with questions. Yes, Robert, and I just want to say, if I may, so yeah, yeah, dad drink. It's called the Single Village Fix. It's in the book. Oh wait, let me show you the book. I have to do this. Publisher would be very mad. There it is. Um, the book is a collection of agave cocktails that I've encountered over the past twelve years, in which agave spirits have uh, risen in profile in uh, this country. And uh, I believe yours was one of the first that I actually encountered, you know? I mean, you invented that drink fairly early on, didn't you? I mean, as far as, there weren't that many mezcal cocktails around. That's right. Oh, you're you're on mute, I think. But... Yeah, it was, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. or maybe, more, maybe more like 15. Invent feels like a stretch, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and simple cocktail, which I always like, you know, just three ingredients. The pineapple gum syrup being the key, since that was kind of rare at the time, but also mezcal was rare at the time. And yeah, and of course, lime juice. So anyway, I just wanted to tell people about your wonderful drink. And also uh, to mention a proper drink. If you remember, I had the San Francisco launch party at your bar, the Bar Agricole. And that was a very uh, memorable event. I remember because a lot of the San Francisco bartenders that I wrote about in the book were actually there at the party. And I was trying to figure out which one of which ones of them were happy and which ones of them were angry with me. I think it was half and half. (laughs) I think the only ones that are angry are the ones that weren't included, honestly. Um, Yeah, we're all not we're all narcissists and just happy to see our name in lights. Um, Shall we? Yeah, go ahead. Fire away. Robert Odin, where did you grow up? I uh, grew up in Wisconsin. I was born in Milwaukee and grew up thereabouts in southeastern Wisconsin, half in the city and half on a farm. So a little city mouse, country mouse thing. Uh, Speaking of which, where do you live now? Uh, I live in Brooklyn, though I am coming to you live from the uh, shore of New Jersey in my uh, mother-in-law's home in Barnegat Light. So the, the Atlantic is just a few feet over there. What does your parents do? My father was a realtor 
And my mother was a school teacher. She taught music and drama. Did you always want to be a writer? I think so. Uh, I wrote, um, as a kid, I would write little uh, fake fantasy novels, you know, for myself. And uh, when I went to high school, I was in the high school newspaper and college newspaper. And uh, my original uh, ambition was to be a cartoonist. Uh, but I have since found that a lot of writers start out wanting to be cartoonists and then they just kind of segue into writing. So, yeah, it was my choice. Yeah, I, I don't remember wanting to be a baseball player or anything like that. And journalism was was the type of writing that you, you generally gravitated toward? Uh, not initially. I mean, I went to Northwestern University and I was a journalism major. But then I switched after um, a quarter and I became an English major. And I thought I was going to write fiction. But then I took a few fiction courses and realized I wasn't any good at that. So I went back to journalism. I ended up being a journalist anyway. Um, well, you have a real facility with plot in your, in your narrative nonfiction. It's great. Uh, Thank you. What did you write about before you wrote about drinks? I wrote about theater for 15 years. My family is a theater family. Um, they're a collection of actors and costume designers and uh, writers and directors. And so I had to find a role for myself in that um, microcosm. And I didn't want to be, and I didn't want to be on stage or anything like that. And so I thought, well, what will I be? I'll, I'll be a theater critic, you know? <laughs> so I wrote theater criticism and theater features for a very long time until I got uh, a little tired of that and switched focus to drink. So were you motivated to write this book by a passion for agave spirits or did you perceive a need in the market or both or neither? Uh, I'd say both. Um, it wasn't so much a passion for the spirit, though I love the spirit and it's fantastic and wonderful and varied and artisanal. But um, as you know, my passion tends to be more on the cocktail side than the spirit side. I really adore cocktails. I love the history of cocktails. It's an American invention. I love the ritual. I love the um, skill of the bartender. I love the rapport between the bartender and the customer. I love the, the ritual of the cocktail hour, you know, just the place that this um, liquid culinary item has in the country. So 12 years ago, I started to notice something that hadn't occurred before, which was that bartenders were putting tequila and mezcal in more and more cocktails. And as you know, that was not the case. With tequila, you had the margarita, the tequila sunrise, not much else. It was something that was drunk as a, as a shot. And mezcal was uh, barely drunk at all because people didn't know what it was or they were scared of it or something like that. But now it's, um, the world's completely turned on its head and uh, there are all these cocktails. And so I have a passion for those cocktails, yes. But I also thought perhaps um, the audience out there that is already cocktail enthusiasts, perhaps they needed a book that um, was purely recipes, just good recipes that involved these agave spirits. There have been a number of books recently that have uh, gone to great lengths and done so successfully to explain what agave spirits are, the history, the heritage and everything. You get into that in a chapter in your book that deals with Mexico and searching for great mezcal. And, um, but I just thought perhaps something a little more utilitarian was needed. Just, you know, a collection of fantastic recipes. And I thought, well, there are enough of these now and it's easy enough to collect them together. Um, I was reminded of a proper drink when reading your introduction to this book in, in the way you sort of elegantly trace mm -hmm. the cultural history of, 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 of these, recent history of these, of these kinds of drinks through a series of individuals. Yes. Um, do you see this culture that we share as, as being shaped by individuals more or by recipes more? Hmm, interesting. Yeah, and when I think of that introduction, which is fairly brief, but if you wanted to, you could take that introduction out and put it into a proper drink and it would just be a new chapter in that book. I've often wished lately that I could do a second edition of a proper drink 
with all the additional chapters that are needed at this point, and also the chapters that I, I missed the first time around. Um, I've been asked that question before. Uh, and, and in fact, when I toured for a proper drink, I, I did an event in Pittsburgh and I got um, a rather um, aggressive accusatory question, you know, because I went with this sort of great person theory that the Kata revival ha happened because of certain important people doing certain things at a certain time. And of course, this is a historical theory, you know, the, the great man, you know, theory, you know, George Washington, Napoleon, whatever you want. But I do believe it, it's true in your industry in a way, because if it wasn't for people like you and other bartenders and bar owners who decided that um, people should be paying more attention to the spirits they were drinking and paying more attention to how their cocktails were being put together and presented. If it, I mean, it was really a bunch of individuals who made this revolution happen. I mean, Lord knows it wasn't the liquor industry that made this happen. They don't, they don't care how their liquor is drunk. You know, it was, it was perfectionists and idealists. And it's, and usually we don't think of bartenders that way. But in this particular um, aspect, it was the bartenders who were the idealists and the dreamers. And I, I do believe they did make it happen. And the same goes for making agave spirits better known and more respected around the world. Do you agree? Or yeah, do you take oh, a yeah. different theory? No, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, recipes... I mean, recipe books are great, but they're largely the, the no, as you know, you can find as many versions of a drink as there are people that write recipe books. So the recipe is an incredibly amorphous thing. Um, and generally yeah. it's kind of subtly different depending on, on the person making it. Um, and really there are about five recipes. Uh, yeah. where people are just pl plugging different things in all the time. And the modern uh, ones speaking evolve. Of the modern ones evolve too. I mean, we've had discussions about your own drinks where you have changed the recipe over time based on which products were available to you or you found a tweak that made the drink better in your opinion. So it is a moving target. Um, speaking of which, will the world need another cocktail recipe book? And if so, I why? think that the past 14 months have proven the answer to that to be yes, <laughs> because we've all been cooped up. Uh, we've all been in our homes a lot. And so we've had to rediscover certain uh, domestic joys, among them cooking and baking, but also cocktail making has made a big comeback. Everyone was so used to going to bars. And I think we were all kind of spoiled. You know, there were great cocktails everywhere. We could go and get them in any town. Um, on any night, but suddenly uh, having to be in and quarantined, uh, we had to figure out how to make them ourselves again. And I think a lot of people enjoyed that and they enjoyed having that special cocktail hour as a moment in the day that you could latch on to when the, the world was spinning into chaos, but you had cocktail hour. So everything was going to be somewhat okay. So uh, cocktail books did well. I know that my own books uh, sold very well the past 14 months and that was gratifying because I was thinking that maybe I was helping people in a weird indirect way so uh yeah I think yeah right now we can use more cocktail books um yeah I think it people have figured out making drinks is, is not that hard the bar <laughs> business is gonna gonna have to confront that when people can make delicious drinks at home for three bucks instead of having them out for 15. That's going to be interesting to see. Uh, why do we like our drinks to have names? Yeah, it's an interesting question, but it's also one of the things I love about cocktails. They do have names. When you think about it, it's very peculiar. Um, like in cooking, beef stew is beef stew. It's a stew made out of beef, you know, and chicken fricassee is a chicken that's been fricasseed. So it's all very plain and prosaic i mean every now and then you get i don't know something that's fanciful you know like baked alaska but um we give drinks names um i think people do like the names it's all part of the fascination because behind every cocktail is a story usually 
Sometimes it's a true story. Sometimes it's a fabricated story, but there's a little story that comes with your cocktail and people like to know that story. And part of that story is the name. So if you give your cocktail an interesting name, they'll say, oh, well, how'd that happen? You know, it's like, why, you know, and also some of these names are majestic, you know, a Manhattan, you know, you're drinking a Manhattan, then you think of the Isle of Manhattan and that's kind of grand and romantic. And you're drinking a daiquiri and you, th- you learn that daiquiri is a little town in Cuba. And then you've got certain images in your mind of what that must be like to drink down there. Um, I think it's lovely. I mean, would you want, would you drink Manhattans if it was called whiskey and vermouth? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I'm wrestling with it. Um, I think you actually, you'd probably have a bar where, that, where the drinks would be like that. No, it's embarrassing to say that I did consult on a bar and I insisted on no names. So it would be like, uh, yeah, um, uh, mezcal drink with fresh lime and ginger. You do Uh, have a drink in the book actually called mezcal cocktail. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which is basically a mezcal Manhattan. And that's like the simplest name I ever heard of. Well, there you go. Uh, you touched on a little bit, but living in New York, I, when I think of named food, most of it comes from New York. Waldorf salad. Uh, I don't know what else. Cobbs is Cobb salad. For, it's a lot of salads. Waldorf salad. Cobb, uh, Cobb salad. salads from L.A. Louis. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Anyway, do you like named food? Yeah, it's I don't know. It, it adds a mystique. I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, it's really about the story, isn't it? That's a very good point. Right, and so uh, if you, I mean, I imagine everyone who's had a Waldorf salad probably wonders at some point, well, what is Waldorf? And then they find out, you know, it's the hotel, and then they find out about the maitre d', and they find out about the late 1800s, and suddenly the salad maybe tastes a little better because it's got this great backstory. I don't know. Um, I know that you are a good cook, and you enjoy cooking. I was curious how you describe the difference between a good drinks recipe book and a good cookbook. If there is one. Well, um, hmm. I do. uh, I am a believer in following the recipe. Um, I think when you're cooking, you can go off chart a little bit more. Although I think you should follow the recipe first and then figure out if you like it or not. And then you can say, well, this really needed more salt or I'm going to like cut back on this other ingredient. Um, That I don't believe works in cocktails at all. I think you have to follow the recipe. I mean, you may decide that you don't like the cocktail as devised and that the bartender has created a bad cocktail. Um, But you don't like go playing around with it. You're not, you're just going to make it worse. You're just going to make it worse. So like follow the recipe. Um, I, I do believe a lot of the books, uh, the recipes are overly complicated and those will sit on the shelf. Um, There is a school out there that likes to collect cookbooks and admire them. And they're beautiful uh, works of art and they lie on your coffee table. I, I don't I don't do that. I want to actually use my cookbooks and I want to actually use my cocktail books. Um, I would say I have a hun- hundred or two hundred cocktail books at home and I make drinks from ten of them because they're simple enough, the ingredients are not hard to get, and they have the, the books have proven themselves. Like if I make a drink from here, it's gonna be good. Or at least it's gonna be a noble attempt which I will respect, if not like. Yeah, same here. I would say it's more like three um, <laughs> books that I... Uh, some, there have been times where it feels like one. Um, so <laughs> why include brand-specific ingredients in your recipes? I respect the um, bartender's intention. So if you submitted a drink to me and you said... You have to use this this brand of mezcal or tequila or else, you know, the drink's not going to work. It's not going to taste the way I want it to taste. I had a divided experience with this book. Half of the recipes are brand specific. And they said, you know, I, I recommend this brand. And others from very uh, well-known and skilled and res- respected bartenders just said tequila. 
you know, Blanco tequila or mezcal. And so then you have to respect that choice as well. They, they think that the, the drink is sturdy and simple enough that it's going to work. You know, there's going to be a plug and play sort of effect. You know, it's like that, um, like for instance, like one of the most simple uh, recipes in there is going to be like something like the mezcal margarita or the mezcal Negroni. No, I, I don't know if you'd agree with me, but I, I think probably uh, a, a large number of mezcals are going to work within that format. So uh, some will work better than others. That's certainly the case. That's always the case. But uh, whatever you happen to have on the shelf, you know, give it a try. It, it's probably going to make a decent Negroni as long as you have, you know, your vermouth and your Italian bitters as well. Yeah, mezcal. So it's such an enormous spirit, like, and it's so so mm -hmm. wild, you know. Yes. I mean, yeah. even even the workaday stuff like Vita, year over year, will change. I mean, the way they're fermenting is is very, you know, open vat and and a lot of a lot of happy accidents. So, in working with it, you kind of got to put it next to stuff that's also has a sort of latitude, you know. I find. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've we've talked about it. To me, it's, it's in, a, in a lot of ways it's most like gin, and that there's so much variety in the category of mezcal. Similarly, with gin, there's kind of infinite variety. Um, That's and right. It's sort of a you know, I find it, and I, I do find that a lot, like you you mentioned the Negroni, that a lot of uh, mezcal slides nicely into a lot of um, gin-based yeah. drinks. Um, and with the rise in popularity of the category, um, we've gotten a lot more brands on the market. Now, some of these are uh, meant for drinking alone. And, and quite frankly, because of the price point, which is often quite expensive, that's probably how you should drink it and how you should serve it in a bar and priced accordingly. But we also have things like Vita that you mentioned that they're intended to be mixing agave spirits. And they, they mean for these things to go in cocktails, which is not a thing that existed before. And uh, now they're, it seems like there's one out every week. Um, it's interesting you mentioned gin. I mean, I, I agree with the comparison, the way you put it. I also think they share um, similarities in that they are both very good mixing uh, spirits. Uh, gin goes with a lot of things. Gin is almost in its way the ultimate cocktail spirit, rarely drunk alone. Um, and I'm, I've been surprised how many different uh, bottles on the shelf uh, go with mezcal. It's really quite amazing. It is. It's interesting that, yeah, those two are somewhat interchangeable, but so different in that gin is really, I think gin is the great cocktail spirit because it's, it's relatively industrial and it's very, very, very affordable, you know? Mm, so, yeah. it, um, you know, it's sort of like perfume. There's just hundreds, thousands of different varieties and it's very, it's very hand, it's very, very human made, you know? And yeah. it tends toward the less expensive, whereas Mezcal, the biggest challenge of working with Mezcal is, is how do you get a Mezcal that's, affordable enough to uh, use and drink right. without affordable enough to use in the bar. Yeah. And meanwhile, you think it's good enough to actually put in cocktails, you know, so that's yeah. a tough one. Speaking of which, um, my favorite line in your, in, in your intro, I think it's the intro. My favorite line is uh, when talking about a certain category of mezcal, which of course I love more expensive, maybe wild single origin, um stuff uh oh, yeah you write quote they are meant for fat wallets and sipping meat yeah that sounds uh, kind of derogatory <laughs> <laughs> but i mean these these things are expensive so i mean i i i'm trying i want you know i'm a cocktail person and the reason i bought this i mean i i wrote this i mean the title says it all it's mezcal and tequila cocktails i want to you know, preach the religion of agave cocktails. You can't, you can't do that with those expensive ones. Um, the reader's not, maybe not going to buy that, maybe can't afford it. And if they buy it, 
you know, there still is this stigma, you know, it used to be about scotch drinkers, you know, or and then it was bourbon drinkers, like you can't mix this. This is too good a spirit. You can't mix it. And I, I think you can mix anything, you know, it, if you want to put, I, I think that's what you were saying earlier, actually, if you want to put that, whatever, a hundred dollar bottle of scotch into a cocktail, go right ahead. Um, but it's about practical terms. So, you know, if they, if they buy those people who buy those bottles, I think they're going to drink them by themselves and people who love agave spirits, but also love cocktails. I think they're going to buy different bottles, you know, bottles that are in that 35 to $70 range. Yeah. I was reminded of that Eric, was it you and Eric Asimov that did that where you tasted through some mezcals at a, at a certain price? Is that right? You talking to are you talking to me or yeah eric? yeah no no eric eric asimov the two oh, eric asimov i'm sorry i thought yeah. you said erica uh, yeah eric asimov no, no, no. who is the wine uh columnist at the new york times a couple times a year he does a spirits column where he does a blind tasting of spirits and uh when he does that he usually calls me in and another spirits writer named David Wondrich. And recently, when was it? About a year. I think it was right before the pandemic hit. We did a yeah. mess of a blind tasting. And um, yeah, I, I haven't looked at that article in a while. So I don't actually remember the results. But um, I do believe oh. there was a price ceiling. Wasn't there? Yes. That's all I remember, too. And I remember being irritated that the wine writer would would sort of put it into that value thing when i mean the best mezcal they're the best spirits in the world i think without a doubt and mm -hmm. uh while the while the while they do get expensive you you can also drink them very very slowly like one taste lasts six hours of these things you know yes. um, and they're they're kind of the last vestiges of a certain kind of spirits making that's pretty much vanished from the earth um so they're really remarkable they're really beautiful and, and i was surprised that eric didn't didn't talk more about that but i want to get more yeah. on your drinks aesthetic okay and your aesthetic in general and on this this topic of price um you do talk about using famous grouse famous grouse is a great cocktail scotch by the way but I, I get the sense knowing you for a little while and reading you and kind of the way you the way you are around town that that, that there's a there's a kind of a there's a relationship between mixed drinks and class for you that, that there's a certain aesthetic um does that sound right could you could you describe it i, I would say that i mean what do you, is what do you mean by in. class like what Oh, well, how the, that a drink should cost, how much should a mixed drink cost? Oh, I, I know people complain about the price of mixed drinks all the time. I've always been a defender of the price. Even if you're doing a cocktail that's $14, $15, $16, um, I've always thought it was an affordable luxury. And when you think of the, the things that are going into the cocktail, you know, all the distillers and the art that went into those bottles, and then you got the skill of the bartender, and then you've got the wonderful bar atmosphere that you're in and whatever the rent is and whatever the decor must have cost and the beautiful glassware and everything. I mean, I don't know why people are complaining about $15. Um, I, 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 I believe that's completely defendable in my opinion. So, I mean, I, and I, I think the cocktail is a very democratic creation. Anybody can go get a cocktail. Um, I can't necessarily go to the best steakhouse in town and, you know, have the ribeye that might cost $70. I, I can't, you know, sometimes I can, and I can't order um, the best wines on the list, you know, which can get into uh, three, three figures. Um, but I can get a cocktail, no matter how bad things are, how poor I am, how much, a little money I have in the bank, I can get a craft cocktail. I can I, I did it last night. <laughs> I saw. Yeah, that thanks. That's exactly what I was looking for. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I I, I knew it when I saw it. Yeah. Uh, what writers do you love? Both 
drinks related and 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 non-drinks related um well uh I like of the I like some of the classic kind of nonfiction writers of the 20th century, the you know, the kind of like New Yorker giants like Joseph Mitchell. AJ Liebling is a big inspiration for me. He wrote about food quite a bit and often wine, uh, never cocktails. Um, well, fiction writers, I mean, I just I I love many of them. My favorite writer is Fitzgerald. You know, that's always been the case ever since I was a teenager. I don't think that really has well, maybe it does now that I think of it. I mean, a lot of the writers, the novelists that I like, uh, there does seem to be a lot of drinking going on in their books. <laughs> so, like, I mean, if you read The Great Gatsby, I mean, they're drinking all kinds of things. Um, well, that's, I have a Fitzgerald question, and uh, it sort of segues. I, I think of you... I like you as a New York writer. I like following your your Instagram feed because I, I like the New York that you're connected to. I like that you're you're interested in the historicity, um, but you're also interested in what's current. You 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 are to me a New York writer as much as you are a drinks writer. I was curious if if you feel coming from the Midwest, like Fitzgerald, if you have a unique perspective and a, and a unique ability to write about New York with fresh eyes or or you have a particular love for New York as someone that comes to it later in life from from relatively far away I, I think there's a long tradition of that um, uh, people from other parts of the country coming to New York and whatever becoming themselves or I don't know. I think I, I forget who said it. There was a saying that all the, all the best New Yorkers came from the Midwest. Um, so, but you know, of course, New Yorkers who are born there are not going to agree with that. You do bring you do bring fresh eyes to it, and you fall in love with the city, uh, and you don't take it for granted because you didn't grow up there, and it always seems so sophisticated and romantic. But then it works in a reverse way. That I mean, many people are just fleeing where they came from. You know, they just want to get out of there. It's it's boring or it's stifling or something. But once you get to New York, you realize what was good about what you left. And um, I think when we mentioned Fitzgerald, and he's like the classic example. He was born in St. Paul, and you know he longed for a glamorous life, and so he he went to New York and then Paris and other places. But um, I don't think he left the Midwest behind. He certainly wrote about it. He did, he made the character at the central uh, center of Great Gatsby a Midwesterner, and and everybody else in that book was kind of a fraud and decadent. But you know, Nick Carraway had some integrity, not much, but some. Um, there are some lovely passages in there that capture the Midwest very well. But uh, um, you know what? I mean, I I I don't know. I guess I'm a New Yorker. I've been here like more than thirty years, but. Uh, you, I don't know. You never leave behind where you came from. Uh, and uh, anyone who moves to New York, unless they're like kidding themselves, they never feel entirely like a New Yorker. There's always like the, the fraud syndrome, you know, spinning around in your head. You know, it's like, I'm not a New Yorker. Um, but then you go back to the Midwest and they don't think you're one of them either anymore. <laughs> so you're between two worlds and you don't belong anywhere. That's a great answer. I, I think we have time for one more and it's sort of, it's sort of of the same ilk. Like I see you as very old fashioned for, for yeah. part of the pun um, or timeless or, or, or liking the aesthetic of the timeless. And that really resonates in New York. There's just a real clear kind of, you know, Gotham timeless aesthetic that you really plugged into which is why I'm so surprised in a good way. I'm not, this is not critical, but how I think you're not on Twitter. Um, but I think that you, you use Instagram. I mean, you are sort of a, a Lucius B, right? A, 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 a person about town writing about, you know, bars that are operating now and people making drinks and, you know, eulogizing bartenders and, and, and restaurants. And it's wonderful. Like, I really, I really love it. There's a real kind of, you know, Thanks, vitality. Uh, and anyway, you use Instagram in a way um, that someone of your taste might not. I wondered if you could you could speak to that 
or, yeah. or, or how, well, you, how you how you how you enjoy it? As as you know, uh, social media is a it's like necessary evil these days. Um, if you you have to sort of be on it. Um, if you're a writer or a journalist or or something, uh, whatever your profession, you you're you're encouraged to have a presence there, even if it's uh, you know it has all of its drawbacks that you can imagine. And um, so I did Instagram. I mean, I did get off Twitter for a long time. I found it very enervating. I, I recently uh, rejoined it simply because a certain individual was kicked off, and I felt I could go back. Um, but uh, uh, Instagram I liked better because it was just pictures and uh, that seemed a little more jolly, a little more friendly. Um, but um, I, I, I think I haven't really understood it or, or liked it uh, until this past 14 months um, because I, I found a new role for it. Um, it was a way to reach out to and support the community that we're in. The community was suffering greatly. You know, everyone was losing their job. There was, all the bars were closing or in danger of closing, and um, they were they were doing all these things. They're doing to go cocktails. They were doing merchandise. They were doing GoFundMe, anything they could do to survive. And you could, I could use my platform to get that word out. Every little bit helped. And 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 um, and I know people have talked to me and they've said that they've appreciated it and they they went to um whatever my account to find out you know what was going on or or maybe be encouraged a bit cheered up a bit uh maybe not everything so so bleak um so um i i i really uh i really i really found a new instagram in the past year okay i'm going to interrupt yeah. here because we have some questions coming from our participants and we want to get a few in before we close out uh, this last one I thought was interesting. What do you think? Uh, oh, can you explain the difference in producing and cooking the process between tequila and mezcal? Uh, Thad, do you want to take this? I mean, you've been down to Mexico a lot. No, okay, I'm taking it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, um, no, you write, you describe it really concisely, really well. Um, so, um, please. please. Mezcal is the broader category, uh, although there have been some legal changes in Mexico recently that make it a little more difficult to say legally what's mezcal and tequila. Before all that, um, they're all, mezcal and tequila are both made from the agave plant, which is a plant that is native to Mexico as well as Central America and parts of Northern America, and it grows very slowly. Um, and, uh, and then they chop off all the leaves and the central part is the pina and that's what cooked and fermented and distilled. Uh, tequila has to be made from just one kind legally, one kind of agave, the, the Blue Weber agave. And mezcal can be made from dozens, dozens of different kinds. And it has been made for hundreds of years. Um, often it's a, an assemblage of these things. And lately you get like single single um, agave spirits. It's really changed quite a bit. Um, the way that the cliche, the way that mezcal is described is always smoky. I mean, that is not always true. Mezcal can be herbal. It can be, um, it can have uh, saline qualities, salty. It can have tropical notes, but it does often have these smoky things. And that's because it is cooked in a fire pit uh, in the ground. And that's where, and the smoke of that uh, informs the flavors as it is being fermented and distilled. And I'm not sure whether I answered the question, but I sure did say a lot of things just there. I, I um, think you did. And actually it's a great lead into the next question. Um, this per, uh, person asks, she loves tequila. She's trying to love mezcal, but not a big fan of the smoky flavor. Any recommendations uh, for mezcals for me to try with a lighter smokiness? Hmm. There are some with a lighter smokiness. As Thad mentioned, um, the, the taste of mezcal uh, has a, a great breadth. And it would be a mistake to say that it's just like this smoky spirit. Um, the thing that I always uh, tell people when they're looking for things like that, um, I'm, I'm sure I hope that they have a bartender they can trust, a bartender that loves agave spirits. And I hope that they have a liquor store that they trust that carries a good selection of agave spirits. So if you have someone you trust and you 
you they've they've steered you in the right direction in the past you can tell them what you're looking for and 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 they can steer you in the right direction and um and hopefully they don't make you feel self-conscious nobody should ever feel self-conscious about learning about spirits you know and don't be intimidated uh anything like that just say what you want um i'll mention one that um i drank the other night it's by a, a line called luna and uh luna uh most uh most mezcals are made with the espadine agave. Um, that's, what would you say, That is that like 90% of the mezcals that are on the market right now? Yeah, because uh, it grows quickly. It's easy to grow. Um, but there's one by Luna. They work with a, a agave plant called Cupriata. And they're, it's, very, it's completely different. It tastes like... Um, you know, bananas and pineapple and all these tropical flavors. Uh, it's, it's, it's not smoky at all. I don't know if you, they can find that, but, but that's, that's one that comes to mind. Um, do you have one you could recommend Thad? That that's like to the opposite of smoky? Sure. And just to speak to that, 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 that whole sort of idea. Um, I mean, a metaphor that I think really works is, um, is barbecue and that too, make tequila or mezcal or agave spirits, you need to caramelize the sugar in the pina, in the plant. Um, and you can, right. so you're, like Robert said, the best ones for, for, for my money are, are the ones that are roasted underground, but it's like barbecue. So if, if you're not good with it and you're, you, you, it just ends up being a smoke bomb. There are no uh, mezcal producers I've met that aspire to a smoky flavor. It's generally, it's generally, you know, a lack, a lack of art. Interestingly enough, if you move into most tequila, they're heating it with steam. So mm -hmm. if you think about cooking, cooking with steam versus cooking with open fire. There's a lot to be said about cooking with open fire. Sometimes cooking with steam can give you clean, beautiful, linear flavors, but but barbecue is is barbecue, and when it's good, it's it, it's amazing. So. Uh, to think about the sort of spectrum of flavors. Another thing to consider is that um, often, often smokiness is, is, um, is an aspect of, of poor distilling or a primitive still that literally smoke is getting out uh, through it. You know, it's a, it's a terracotta or, or an old copper still or, uh, and smoke is escaping and, and, and penetrating the spirit. So that, that again is um, a mistake. Uh, but yeah, I, I like to think about it that way. Uh, Real Monero, R-E-A-L-M-I-N-E-R-O, -E uh, is a woman uh, in Minas um, who makes just beautiful, beautiful um, stuff. And this is for sipping. Uh, she does do some Mespadine, um, but she does the Silvestres or the Wild. She does a lot of those, which if you're wanting to drink the stuff neat and really you know, have a psychedelic experience, not in, 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 in the, the drug sense, but just having your mind blown by flavors you've never experienced before. Uh, she's a great one. Um, yeah. I'd like to say two other things uh, for this person. I'm not sure where they live, but uh, chances are there is an agave bar near them. And a good way to do this, you know, without, you know, investing a lot in a bunch of bottles and trying to figure out which one you like, often they have tastings, you know, like you can buy a, a small tasting, like one ounce of like three different mezcals, taste them in a row, and you spend, I don't know how much, not too much. And then by that way, you'll find, you know, what you're looking for and what you want. And also, one of the reasons I wrote the book is, you know, if, I mean, mezcal is a very forthright spirit it's got a strong personality there's no denying no matter what mezcal you're having it's strong so if it's perhaps too strong for you i mean that's what cocktails are for you put it in with a bunch of other ingredients and it becomes balanced and it becomes this other whole and then that becomes um perhaps a more uh i don't know palatable introduction to mezcal okay i think that's a good answer um here's a great question to almost closed we've got two more so are there okay. certain drinks um you associate with spring or summer well i think everyone thinks about margaritas in the summer so um it's funny with the fate of the margarita and you've probably seen this that in the past five years or more is uh that people keep ordering it with mezcal now instead of tequila they don't really know that they want mezcal they order for they order a spicy margarita 
Yeah, but that's what that means. Um, so summer's coming up. Great time to have margaritas. Palomas are really a, a, a standard Mexican drink. It's very refreshing. Um, there are a few sours in the book that would uh, fit the bill of a summer cocktail. There's one called the Siesta, which is like a tequila version of a Hemingway daiquiri. And there's one called Naked and Famous, which is a mezcal version of a paper plane. If you know that drink, it's a bourbon sour with Aperol. Um, you have some summer drinks, Thad? Oh, lost it. Yeah. I think you might be muted there, Thad. Yeah, I agree. Summer, spring, you know, look to citrus. I mean, I like sours with different sweetening components, which can be, you know, they end up being daisies or margaritas or fixes or, you know, grab some, try sweetening, get some limes, get some lemons, get some mezcal, and then try all different kinds of ways of sweetening, you know, lem uh, honey, apricot jam, you know, what, uh, pineapple syrup, whatever, and, and, and just start to see how, um, yeah, because margaritas and sours are, are what you drink in, in spring and summer when it's warm. But, but then you can start to see how crazy uh, mezcal is. And there's, it reacts with all different kinds of flavors. Um, so simple three ingredient drinks with different, different sweeteners. Uh, that's what I say. Okay. Okay. And I think one last question before we close. And uh, the person who asked about the, the smokiness or the um, asked also, uh, what do you think the next hot spirit is going to be, assuming that tequila and mezcal are having their moment now? So there's already well, on to the next thing. First, I'd say, I mean, I don't think it's a moment. Um, certainly, there have been hot spirits over the past 20 years that have come and gone, you know, absinthe being the big example. Um, but uh, we've seen 10 years of this popularity growing. Um, the number of agave spirits on the market, uh, the, the, the sales from year to year just continue to climb. So it's not really a trend that's going away. I think mezcal and tequila are here to stay, both as spirits and as mixing spirits. What would the next one be? Hmm. I don't know. Well, we'll wait till you write your next book and then we'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I do want to mention briefly, Thad, and I wanted to talk about this. My wife, my lovely wife, Mary Kate, who's watching in the other room, she brought in another drink from the book. It's called the uh, Elegante. It is th perhaps the sim well, not it's the simplest drink in the book next to your uh, mezcal cocktail. It's just uh, mezcal, about two and a quarter ounces, and then one ounce of ginger liqueur. And it's um, a riff on a drink by somebody that Thad and I both knew called uh, Gary Regan, Gaz Regan. He created a drink in 1993 called the Debonair. Now, back in the 90s, that's when single malt scotch was super hot. And so his drink was ginger liqueur and scotch. And so I just thought, well, let's see, mix and match. Let's see if this works. So here it is. Very simple. It's a good one to start with. Have you tried this one, Thad? Did you try mixing this up? What do you think? Yeah, when no, it was great. When we died, when when we died, uh, Freudian slip. When Gary died, we were talking about a drink to run. Uh, to, oh, to, right, to sort yes. of honor him. Yeah, I reminded you about this one. Did you end up yeah. serving it on the menu? We didn't get our shit together. Oh, okay. <laughs> we we worked on some recipes. Yeah, Gary. He he did pass away two years ago. He wrote a book in the '90s called "The New Modern Classics." And one of them was this, which he made himself. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little nod to Gary. Uh, so, here's uh, Gary. All right, well, to here's, Gary. here's to you. I'm going to toast with my seltzer. Thank you so much, Robert and Thad, for doing this tonight. It was great. We had a great crowd, great questions. I hope everybody's safe. And please, please go down to the chat box and buy Robert's new book. I think it's a great thing to put on your shelf for the summer. So, yes. thank you. And, then, and buy it at these bookstores. Buy Absolutely. it at these independent bookstores. Absolutely. Book Hampton. Come on, go for hey, it. Hey, I see people. People got cocktails. This is good. This is good. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much.